All right, so we're going to get into what we call producer theory. Producer theory. This is chapter 10. So, chapter 10. Basically, chapter 10 and 11 is what we're getting into. Oh, we're in chapter 10 and 11? Yeah. Okay. We just finished 8. We're skipping 9. 9 is a, a little bit more detail on utility. That, um, it's awesome stuff, but we just don't, we only have so much time in this class, so we're going to skip that. Um, so chapter 10 gets into producer theory. Chapter 8, especially, the one we just came off, we really dug in deep into what the consumer's brain was thinking with happiness, right? Maximizing happiness, subject to, I know that's some abstract stuff. Here's the good news. Not too much of that bridges on, so if you're a little froggy on that whole concept, uh, the good news is we don't really, that is kind of done in your life. Potentially. So hopefully you got something from it with, with consumer choice and behavior. Uh, it, it does help create, gives kind of the backbone for the demand curve, for instance, and what is demand and all that stuff. So it's kind of the consumer in detail up to that point is what we focused on. And so now we're going to talk about profits and the producer. So producer theory um, assumes Gotta watch out for those assumptions. Assumes a firm is a firm's objective, let's say. A firm's objective is to maximize profit. So with the consumer in chapter eight, we're maximizing our objective was to maximize happiness. And now with the producer, we're going to maximize profit. And what was that profit equation? We put it on the board before and talked about it. What was profit? Equation goggles here. You want to earn a profit, how do you calculate your total profit? So cost of production was worked into there. What else did we need? Revenue, right? So we had how did we fit that into an equation then between the revenue and the cost? Revenue minus cost. Good. So total revenue, I'll just write it out this time. Total revenue, we've written this on the board before. Total money in the cash register, right? So when you hear me say this is, you know, cash register money, money that came in through sales, total revenue minus total cost. So if we're running a lemonade stand and we've got uh, $33 worth of sales and we have lemonade powder and water and some other junk of 10, 33 minus 10 means I made 23 bucks. Right? That's the way the Fortune 500 company, same equation they use, just has more stuff and there's some more complications, but this is really the backbone to, to profits. Oh, we're using high profit. Highest profit, right. So this is total profit. In macro class, I use that as inflation. So sorry for the confusion, but this is micro class, so now it's profit. Okay, those of you who haven't had macro, then it doesn't matter, but then I'll tell you that I am switching it once we get back. All right, so um, when we think about this equation, um, we want to think about all kinds of things. So what is the thing, if we break this down another level, what is this? What's the equation now for total revenue? It's a little one. It's not a big deal, but... How do we calculate total revenue, the money in the cash register? Price times quantity. Good. Price times quantity, yeah. And quantity sold in this case, because it's, it's what the consumers bought, but it's also what they produce. 
But in general, we just say price times quantity, T times Q. And then we've got total cost that has a uh, bunch of different stuff with it that's going to help break us down. So total cost, we have lots of different types of costs. Some are with Q, some are not. But I'm just going to put TC for now to keep it simple. And for right now, I just want to kind of highlight this part of the profit equation will really hit it hard with the Chapter 11 stuff this week. And what I'm going to start off today, we might even dip into some of this Chapter 11 stuff even uh, today yet, because that's where the, the bulk of things are. But um, the whole equation together, profits in general, is kind of the Chapter 10 stuff. All right. Um, our total cost, actually, let me, yeah, I'll write it up here. Total cost is the sum of what economists call explicit cost and implicit cost. Which is what our theme for starting today is going to be. Implicit cost plus explicit cost. All right. Let's do a little example to motivate things. So suppose we've got an English professor and that English professor is thinking about opening up a restaurant. So currently, the English professor is making 60000 a year here at Ottawa. So suppose an English professor currently making 60000 a year. I'm going to use K a lot here for thousands. So 60K a year decides to open a restaurant. So, uh, restaurant name. Help me out. What's the name of the restaurant? What did, what did I hear? Days? Days. Okay, days as in D-A-Y-S or days as in daisy chain or days as in cool dude D-A-Y-Z or what do you think? Your What's that? Your interpretation. Your interpretation. Well, somebody else help me out. Sam gave me days. How do we spell days? D-A-Y-Z. D -A -Y -Z. All right. Days. All right. So open a restaurant, days. And starts calculating up its cost, his cost. He's got rent for the building coming in at 50 grand a year. Some serious stuff there, right? 50 grand a year. Then he's got the grill and coolers, all that kind of equipment, the deep fryer, etc. He can rent and upkeep at two hundred thousand per year. And then he's got to hire some cooks, some wait staff, <coughs> some dishwashers, other sorts of labor. All of that is going to come out at one hundred and ten thousand per year. And then lastly, the ex-professor, now ex-professor, right, going to start his own restaurant, sure, ex. is the manager. The ex-professor is the manager so that he doesn't 
have to pay. The ex-prof is the manager, so he doesn't have to pay. Uh, the market rate, the market rate of $35,000 per year, of 35000 for a manager. If total revenue equals four hundred thousand per year, if total revenue equals four hundred thousand dollars a year, what is profit? So I'm going to walk around the room. You guys can talk to your neighbor if you want. Here's all the details of the case. And I want you to calculate profit. I'm going to give you about three minutes, and I'm going to randomly select three of you to come to the board and share your work. And Davis, you will be on the list of potential randomness, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got a few days to do that. Ain't nothing, no thing, bro. Ain't no 400 <laughs> minus 360. Yeah, so it's 40,000. Yeah, so it's not worth it.
Show of hands. Davis is on. Okay. <laughs> How many people got other answers? Okay, other people, come on up to the board. All of you can come up. What do we have? Three of you, four of you? Sell your hand. Yeah, you can do it right. Yeah, right in here sounds good. Limousine. Oh. <laughs> oh snap, man. We should track that 35k from uh, cost. Oh, snap. We did it wrong. Yeah, So you take 35 away from that 360. 360 total, I think, is where Jennifer and Chris and Jose got this. This was 360,000. He's got it. Carry the one. And we get it. Oh, shoot. All right, grab your chairs. Ooh, we got three different, no, two different answers. Okay, we got a negative 20,000, and Matt, you got a 75. All right, so Matt, tell everybody what you did there. So I'll just start with you since these guys had the same. Uh, I just subtracted 35 out of the Cook's weight staff and 110 that he put. So you took this and essentially threw it into part of the cost calculation. Right, but I took it out because he's not paying that 35. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, you threw me there for the, okay, got you. All right, so you actually got bigger from 40 plus 35. Right. That's kind of what you did. Right. Okay. Any other comments, answers? I guess let me go to the 20 here. What did you guys do? Uh, we 360 is what we came up with, but then you have to add the implicit cost of the 60 gig he's not making into the total cost. So you threw in his professor salary. Yeah. Okay. And why is that? He went from making 60 So he's paying himself 60000 and then he gets to claim a $20,000 loss on his tax return? No, and not saying he's paying himself, that's just that money. Could have been made. Okay, could have been made. Okay. So I thought Matt had maybe done the other one. Did anybody throw in the 35 as part of this calculation? No. No. Davis did. Davis, you did? Oh. Why, why did you do that? No, I was going to say this. Oh, hold on. Uh, you're either muted or. Are you muted? I'm not muted. No. Okay, now I can hear you. A little louder. I was going to say there's no reason to equate the 35000 because you didn't include it with the uh, the cooks and the staff. You never included the manager because it's no one separate. Uh, like, they make more than the regular staff. They make more than the regular staff. So you wanted to throw it in here. No, I wouldn't have. I you wouldn't know. have thrown it in here. Okay. So we... go ahead. Sorry, did, what about the cost for food as well? like the actual supplies of the food and the pans and whatnot? Well, these are all the explicit costs for sure. And so the question we're starting to raise is, should he pay himself something? And if so, why, right? So let me, let me back up. I, I think the way most of you calculated it is correct in some cases. Okay, so this 40,000 a year, if we go and the professor goes to his accountant and says, hey, I made 40000 you know, what do you, what do you think? And the accountant tells him, well, wait a second here. According to IRS regulation 93642, you have to claim some pay for yourself at market pay. And so the accountant, so first of all, I agree with you guys here, the English professor probably is doing 400 minus the 360K equals the 40K, just like what you guys did. And his accountant came back and said, oh, no, under that IRS regulation, you need to subtract off the market pay for yourself, leaving you with 5,000. English professor turns back to the accountant and says, I don't care what you do with your hocus pocus last time I checked. If I'm paying myself 35000 and 
I get 5,000 profit, 35 plus 5 equals 40. Right? Now, what would be the reason that we might want to use the accountant's calculation other than for just pure IRS reasons? I mean, is there any additional information that we're getting from that calculation? Government wants their slice, yes, but I'm trying to, and that's true, that's a reason all by itself, but I'm trying to avoid that even outside of the government needing their slice. Does this give us some additional information about this business? Okay, yeah, so if there's other owners, so what is this, what is this profit reflecting? Bo said that if, if some of the other owners, if this was a corporation, they could potentially get a slice of the five. So in essence, what does five reflect? 5,000 a profit reflects what? Let me go way back to Jake. Yeah, how well the business is doing, right? So the business, if it didn't have him in there, and, and assuming that you can find a decent manager for is what this is implicitly saying, the business is making $5,000. So it does give us some additional information, like if the professor maybe stepped away from it or something else, then they're at least above, above water. All right, but I kind of like where Dirk and Wyatt ended up going here. The econ student, a student in principles of micro 101, might calculate it with the 60,000. Now, with that, we are essentially substituting this for 60, correct? I'm following you guys right here. So 60,000 equal the negative 20,000. Now, Chief, question for Donna? If you did that, then you wouldn't have to see the manager, so you'd have to take from me. Okay, yeah, so we can start to kind of see the differences here. Here's the good news. With this particular exercise, everybody was right, it sounds like, because I wasn't specific enough in what I was asking. Unfortunately, there's zero points associated with that particular question this semester, so overall grade-wise, it didn't have a big impact. But you guys were all right so far. None of these methods are wrong, but they each address a different question, right? The English professor kind of wants to know, well, how much money do I have because I need to buy diapers for my kids and I got to pay my rent and my and my buy some food for myself or my household or whatever. So from a cash flow standpoint for the professor, forty thousand is the right number for for them. Is how much profit the English professor is making. From the accountant's perspective, this is correct due to IRS reasons and maybe uh, owner, other owners if they're involved with this. This might be technically correct to fill out the IRS tax form. But this one, I think, is the best one. But I'm biased, as you guys know. Uh, this particular form of profit is sending a signal. Sending a signal to the English professor. What is that signal to the English professor? Old job. Go back to teaching, right? Or that's kind of a positive way of putting this spin on it. It's also kind of saying you suck. You suck. You suck. You suck. Go do something else. Oh no, what should I do? Just go do it. I've got it built into the equation. Go do your other thing. Go do your opportunity cost, right? The other thing you are not doing is what we need to pay you for it to get it. And so by having profits include this in here, it acts as a signal to make good decisions. Now, one thing that's a bit of a simplification, I'll get to you guys' question here in a sec. One of the things that's a bit of a simplification is that I haven't modeled into my economic model here how much he truly hates you guys at this point in his life. Right? He just hates reading another paper from another college student. It hurts him. He could put a monetary value on that hurt, which is pain and suffering. 
but instead he just still runs the restaurant. Right? So I haven't built that into the economic model. I could, but I have not. So I just wanted to point that out, that we could continue to make this richer and fuller in what his true opportunity cost is. But in this case, I just put in his pay, and it's a reasonable alternative, and this is how it's shaking out. You suck. You suck. All right. Wyatt, I saw your hand first. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to incorporate the 35K into the econ student equation? And I don't know if it'd be a plus or a minus saying that he made 35K as manager, or if it should be subtracted out the 400K altogether as... So depending on the on the purpose, they all work in harmony with each other anyway, right? Because if he calculates both, which we do in economics class, we actually we know how to do both. We know what the accountant does. I mean, in a lot of ways, accounting is kind of a subdiscipline of economics uh, that features how to keep track of books. Um, and so by knowing both, yeah, you start to get the right picture. You suck. Go do something else. What? Go teach. I go teach and I make how much? 60. The restaurant still exists. I make five. And now I'm making 65. So I can place by including both. And that, this comes back to this initial equation right here, folks. The implicit cost. The cost of running the restaurant had an implicit cost of sixty thousand. The IRS won't let you write off the sixty thousand, or it'll end up, you know, kind of playing through at the end. So that you don't want to put up here for filling out your tax return, or you might end up in jail, or you'll get audited and, and kind of pay the piper. But for decision making, we should include the implicit cost as well as the explicit cost. So these explicit costs are really accounting costs, usually. And so what makes this what I call economic art is that this is a little harder to calculate. So the implicit costs are what I call econ art, art form. The economist is an artist. We create and we listen and hopefully we, we make a good judgment call on what the value of foregone opportunities are, right, with the implicit. And then we add them all together. Together, these two things make our total opportunity cost, those things that are explicit and those things that are implicit. All right, questions or comments on that? All right, so let's, uh, let's do a little bit different here. Suppose yeah. that. The econ prof, or I'm sorry, the English prof hangs in there, and revenues climb to 420. So example number two. Suppose there's an increase in total revenue to 420 thousand dollars. What is the new profit, economic profit? The economic profit, the econ student. So we're going to start calling that economic profit. I'll uh, define here in a little bit later. So if total revenue climbs to 420, what is economic profit equal to? Zero. 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 Right. So now we've got 420,000 worth of revenue minus the 360, just like before our explicit cost. Zero. Now, what is the signal? You still suck? <laughs> At zero, getting better. What are you seeing here? What do we get? Your charity case. Looks like you're coming in a bit. What's your name? Yes. What signal are you seeing? Zero profit. Zero economic profit. Zero economic profit. Zero 
What is our economic problem? <coughs> Four sixty. What are we at? Forty grand, right? So four sixty minus our explicit cost again of three sixty minus our implicit cost, what we could be making as a professor, finally gives us our forty thousand dollars worth of profit. Now, this one's not hard to see, right? Forty thousand economic profit. <laughs> now, back, yeah, back to back to English professor and the way he calculates profits. What is he making? A hundred thousand. Right. So he's actually making a hundred because he's again the one making the sixty. Sixty plus forty is a hundred. So he's really making a hundred grand. So you know the the system saying, hey, good job, you know, don't even think about going back to those kids you hate in college. You don't have to stand them anymore. You're doing good with our current restaurant business. Forty thousand dollars of profit. Now, what is the signal? Continue, continue, but there's a bigger signal happening now that you guys haven't thought about yet. What else is going out to the general marketplace? What type of signal? Get into this market. Get into this market. There is a freaking English professor who is hitting it big, knocking it out of the park, selling barbecue in Ottawa. I know how to sell barbecue, or better yet, Oklahoma Joe's, which is now Kent Joe's Kansas City Barbecue, all of a sudden hears of this hot market in Ottawa. It says, well, there's a little little space up on Main Street. Maybe I'll go open up the shop, right? So from the market's perspective, it's definitely telling the professor, hey, you're doing good, continue, continue. But more importantly, from an economist's perspective, it's signaling enter, enter, enter me. There are enormous profits, much higher than your opportunity costs, if you start up a business here. Enter, enter, enter. All right, so this is the continue and possibly signaling to others to enter. All right, so the signal is stay for the professor and others enter. All right, so let me summarize these signals. Summary of signals. Number one, if economic profit is less than zero, the signal that it's giving is exit. Or, more affectionately known as you suck. Okay, so exit. We're going to have the professor maybe exit personally or possibly the whole business if it's all less than zero. Number two, if economic profit is equal to zero, that is okay. Okay in the sense that you're covering all opportunity costs. Covering all opportunity cost that one of those top three principles in economics class that we started off in chapter two covering all opportunity costs and then finally number three when profits are greater than zero we get the end And that comes about 
is that other uh, entrepreneurs see big profits greater than opportunity costs. That's a great place to park my money. So, and yeah. you, <laughs> yes, this might be kind of an out of the box question, but like, if it's a smaller business, it won't tend to have like a, a profits report. So, how would other entrepreneurs and companies know to get into that market? If they, how would they find out they're making make more than profit? Okay, yeah. So, if we have a small business like Pizza Time or Pizza Village here in, in Ottawa. Their profits reports are not public. So how would a entrepreneur know whether they're getting the you sucker, the just okay, or the enter signal? What would be some ways that they would start to think that or learn that? Good question. Uh, they have like used the product before. And they okay. agree with the way it's So if it's pizza, for instance, yeah. or something, they have an understanding of the product. If they have an understanding of the product, can they have an understanding of the cost? Yeah, probably, right? X amount of cheese, certain amount of sauce. You've got to have people there to run the business. A pizza oven costs this. Dishwashers cost this. So all of those explicit costs that somebody that gets to know the business, they're going to be able to figure out the cost. So then what are they really keying in on to know whether they've got the enter signal or one of these others? The customer and the what? You gotta know your own implicit cost, that's for sure. And they that they might have a hard time knowing. What else? What's the other side of the equation besides cost? Starting. Total revenue. Can they how would they get a feel for that? If we thought Pizza Village was knocking it out of the park, and I was thinking about coming to Ottawa with a business, what might I do Monday through Sunday, although they're closed, I think, on Sunday? What's that? Sorry, I heard somebody. Be brave. See how many people are coming in and out, right? You don't have to be a private investigator. Freaking sit there during the dinner hour and count heads as they go in the door. You think you can estimate a little bit on the revenue side how busy? Do you think that what first attracted to them was everybody's saying there's reviews in the paper and it's shoulder to shoulder in that pizza village, man, you can't even get in there, you gotta get reservations now, or what you know, whatever. You start to sense some of that. And so if you know the costs, if the costs are fairly easy to get a hold of, and you know your own implicit costs, so you know the explicit cost, the implicit cost. The always, especially with restaurants and other retail businesses, volume is the key. We got to be able to turn over some pies, baby, right? We can't have just 12 pizzas going out a night. We need 100. We need, you know, if we're making lots of profit, we have lots of volume of customers. Again, we won't be able to necessarily analyze each ticket, and you know, maybe we could fly off a waitress or to you know, give us some information. Get all sneaky about it. Where's that going to be on the ethical side of things? Probably pushing it. It might not be illegal, but slip a hundred dollar bill, say, hey, could you just photocopy off your tickets, take your smartphone and all your tickets at the end of the night? Just email that to me, here's a hundred bucks. Do you think people have done that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it's not necessarily oh, even yeah. illegal to maybe do something along those lines. I might be pushing it a little bit, but but part of it. But this is how the real world works, folks. This is this is what they do. So good question on on how a small business might do it. Uh, it is much easier with a publicly traded company that this stuff is public information, right? And then you can kind of tear it apart and, and do it. Okay, any other questions or comments on our professor? All right, let's make sure you're not sleeping here. Let's do uh, the grill. So let's say example number four here, somewhat of an extension. Example number four. Where's my black? Example number four. Suppose that the grill or that the restaurant needs the new grill. 
suppose a restaurant, I should say days, suppose days needs a new grill. The grill that they got is too small. The business has been booming. Maybe they've got this profit thing going on over here with economic profit greater than zero. Needs a new grill. And its price for the size that they need is $10,000. So they're faced with the dilemma, should we pay cash or get a loan with an interest rate of 10% for one year? Not uncommon at all, especially for small businesses, if, if, if you've got an equipment supplier, they might have a lease deal or a, a no interest loan or some sort of loan here for a dollar. Let's just say that the interest rate is 10%, no co monthly compounding, we're not trying to make this finance class. One year loan, 10%, how much is the interest gonna be? Thousand, all right. so. Should we pay cash or should we get a loan? Let me tell you this too. We do have enough cash on hand to possibly pay cash. So we, let's say we got $30,000 in our operating account. Should we pay cash or should we get a loan? So pay cash, cash or get a loan. Cash is king. Cash is king, I hear. We got a loan. Cash. Cash. All right, so if, you got the, the cash. if we pay cash, what is our total cost? 10000 If we get loan, what is our total cost? 11000 Plus the $1,000 where the interest gives me 11000 So, should we get a loan or should we pay cash? Well, 10,000 is less than 11,000. It's kind of a no brainer to pay cash, right? Why? That's not really relevant. Yeah, but we're definitely getting the grill. We're done. So, the decision here is are we. Should we pay cash for the grill or should we get a loan for the grill? Is all I'm asking. We're getting the grill. The, the business is there, baby. Look at this. This is 40 grand of economic profit. We got True. We got the business. The cash is banked. Should we pay cash or should we get the loan? Good. I have not heard the right answer yet. How many people say loan? A few loans. How many people say cash? All cash. Those of you in my personal finance class, I'm awfully proud of you, but we're going to we're going to look at this a little differently. So I still haven't heard the right answer. Nobody said the right answer. Chisholm? Uh, kind of. You need to extend that a little bit. There is something here that you could tell me definitely whether we should do cash or loan. Can't split it. Yeah, I mean, in theory you could, but I'm just going to force the issue with one. What is the deciding factor of whether you should get a loan or not? We got the cash on hand. So the cash is there. We got 30 grand. We could, we could cut a check easy. Is it fair to compare the $11,000 cost one year from now versus $10,000 today? Now, what if I flip it on you and I say, suppose you could pay $10,000 a year from now, this was zero interest loan, $10,000 a year from now or $10,000 today, which one's more valuable to you? To pay off a year from now, right? Why? Why is that more valuable to you today? You could get more profit, but I want to tie it right back to this $10,000. Can we make any money on the 10,000 this year? One year, you've got 10,000 cash. Is it possible to make any sort of interest rate if you took that money and invested it elsewhere? Even if you went to a stupid bank, you could get 
3% probably, even in today's numbers. So you're giving up $300 if you give up the 3%. So is it really fair to look at these two numbers the way we have it presented? No. Now, if I could find an investment that paid me 15%, on my $10,000. Should I get the loan or should I pay cash? Get the loan. If I can take this $10,000 and get 15%, what do I have? What am I holding a year from now? More than 500, 11,500. 11, I earn $1,500 on the money. I pay back the loan. Oh, and you're meant after, I'm holding the $500, right? So this, the correct answer on this is that it depends. Depends on what? Depends on your opportunity cost, your investment opportunities. That's right. If you're just going to be putting it in the bank and earning the lousy 3%, should you pay cash or should you get the loan? Then you should pay cash. But if you're getting the 15% due to expanding your business or maybe doing something else, I don't know how you're getting the 15%, then you're better off getting the loan. All right, so answer, depends. All those good college questions kind of have that answer. We've got to dig a little deeper. Depends on the opportunity cost of the 10,000 cash. Depends on the opportunity cost of the 10,000 cash. So if your opportunity cost is 3%, if your opportunity cost is 3%, like we just said, then pay cash. Why? Because $10,300, adding in the implicit cost of cash, the implicit cost of cash was 3% on the $10,000. That's the true cost when I compare it to the cost of the loan. $10,300 is less than $11,000. If, however, your opportunity cost was 15%, if opportunity cost is equal to 15%, then get loan. Because the cost of the grill at 15% is now eleven thousand five hundred because you gave you would be giving up that fifteen percent return, and so now it flips around on you. It's actually cheaper to get the interest rate. So the fifteen hundred dollar interest is greater than the $1,000 interest for the loan. Okay, questions there? Yeah. So basically, cash like 10%. Right. So if the interest rate was, I'm sorry, if your opportunity cost was 10%, that's our break-even point, right? So 10% is where we, holding all other things constant, which I pretty much can't emphasize enough in this particular case. I'll come back to that in a sec. But use it, just looking at these numbers financially, interest rate only and holding risk and other things constant, then we've got the break-even being 10%. If, if I have a 10% opportunity cost, these two things are equal, it's like, ah, should I get a loan, should I pay cash? Ah, it doesn't really matter. Now, let me come back to reality for a second. Which one should you do? 
if it really is break even in the real world. So let me kind of break off of the economic model here for a second and add in another level of complication. Like what are some things that might be, need to be considered if this was really you and it was 10%? We're at this break even point. Hand up? No, nope. just looking. Let me go to somebody else here in back. What do you think? What are you guys doing back here? I see some laptops open, so you're studying hard. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah. You got this on your notes, or? Oh, we're closing a bunch of windows. Huh? Yeah, but it's got to be this economic. So, what do you think with this problem? Don't know? Ike, where are you at? So you guys with the laptops, the laptops are there to take notes on where we're at, right? You guys in the back and stuff, make sure you're where you at. That's Jose, what do you think? If we pay cash to the coin flip, what do you think? What are some things? Should I pay cash or not? No, we've already covered that, though. The interest is, is the same. So you can earn 10% on your 10,000, or you can get a loan for 10%. So it's kind of a push, but you know which one's which one's better? Okay, so Jake's arguing that let's keep our cash on hand in case something else comes up with our business. A little bit of a cushion. Great comment. What else? Yeah. I'd rather pay with cash and get it out of the way like ahead of time than have okay. to think about it. Not have that payment, yeah, you kind of know. So which one do you know with greater certainty likely? The 10% the loan deal or what you might be able to do with your cash? So 10% is defined. And so with all the other uncertainty, some people might like to, since it's a coin flip anyway, with the uncertainty on the 10%, do I make 10% or do I really make 5% or there's a little bit of risk? So some people might pay the cash, get it done, don't have to worry about it, go on and live in, live in their business, doing their business and not have that future payment. If It's kind of similar to Jake's in a way that if my business takes a downfall, I've already got that payment made, right? It's already gone next year. Now, if Jake is holding on to the cash the whole year, just in case something happens or whatever, that's kind of serving a similar purpose. All right, so those are just some thoughts on you know real world decisions that are all economic in nature that um, when we do simplifications like this, most people don't do what we just did, right? So that's what we're bringing to the table with economics is to really think about what could I have done with the cash if I didn't put it in there or not? And then you can add in those other fun details like we just mentioned. And then you're, you're really starting to hopefully make a, a rational decision that works for you and your business. Okay. Questions, comments there? All right. So let me put on that since we brought up the 10%. So note. Um, Coin flip if opportunity cost is 10%. In other words, you're indifferent, similar to what we did with our beer and pizza last time. Should I buy my fourth beer or my uh, third pizza? And, and now we don't have that little rule of always go with beer. It, it, it might be a coin flip might be the best way. So then in the real world here, we might start think about other considerations. And these might be very personal in nature. Other considerations such as risk, risk preference, and other uncertainty. I know if I pay cash today, the grill cost is gone, period. End of story. If I take the loan, I don't know for sure that I'm going to have 11000 to pay the grill in the future, right? It kind of adds, adds a little bit of uncertainty. So, again, that might be just a, a personal decision for the business. 
All right. Time for a little love gov. Part three. The video is pretty good. I do like love. I do. Enjoy the my new show, Grandfather. Stick around. Your health is important to me. I was just talking with your doctor to make sure they were qualified. Well, this seems a little intrusive. If making sure you get the health care you deserve is intrusive, then I will be constantly intrusive for the rest of your life. And it will be impossible to get rid of me. Now, let's get you undressed. Right now? Making me feel uncomfortable. Yeah, well, there's some things in your file that make me uncomfortable. <sighs> I don't know why I stayed with him so long. It was kind of charming, in a way. Like, I wanted to punch him, but not in the face. I thought he really cared for me. You know, the way he always told me, Alexis, I really care for you. In the end, he only cared for himself. It's tough. What's going on? My job just canceled health insurance because it's getting too expensive for them. So Libby's helping me find a new plan. If you wanted to know about health insurance, you should have asked me. Do you know about health insurance? When it's something important, I don't get my job to know. That's who I am. Well, I'd like to find a new plan soon because I think I'm getting a cold. Oh, you wouldn't use health insurance for a cold. You expect to get colds every so often. Insurance should be for things we don't expect. So we all agreed to contribute a little bit now so that we're covered in case something really big happens. Like if I get hit by a car. I would definitely contribute to you getting hit by a car. <laughs> health insurance is about people getting the care that they want. Well, Libby thinks I should get a health savings account plan where I just do catastrophic coverage. And it's because of people like Libby. There are so many Americans right now who don't have health coverage. For this to work, everybody needs to pay their fair share. Right? It's a delicate balance, but with the right focus and forced intervention, everything will work out. Perfect. Do you have a screwdriver? I just don't understand why it has to be so expensive. It's because of how people treat insurance. We're all divorced from the actual cost, but mandated to pay for certain things, completely destroying market incentives to reduce costs. You can see about it right on here. Um, hello? Hey, Lenny. It's your conscience. I think it's pretty signaling for you to be talking about people's health and vulgar free markets. And the best way to reduce costs is with free markets. Look, I'm not a doctor, though that is a group of people I'm pretty sure I know a little bit more than. It just seems to me all this talk about health insurance and free markets, it's just making me more sick. Fine. I'll get going. Thank you. Actually, there is one more thing that I want to say. Tell you what, why don't I go get you something to eat? Thanks, Gov. You're always looking out for me. I'm always looking out for everyone. Oh, hey, sweetie. I brought dinner. You're the best. Of course. By the way, surprise. I found a health insurance plan for you. I already enrolled you and signed you up. Wait, what? Alexis, I really care for you. And you seem so confused about all the choices, and I really wanted to help, and this is a big part of what I do, is protect people from choices. Anyways, it's a great plan. I mean, check out the sweet deal you're getting on pediatric dental. But I don't have kids. Yeah, but other people have kids. I don't have kids. You know, that's not an insurance. That's just giving my money to the insurance company. Yeah, who then use it to give to other people to pay for their insurance. You understand? This is more than my entire grocery budget and my car payment combined. That is so cool that you can just do math in your head like that. Just 
How am I supposed to afford this? You can always apply for subsidy. But I thought the whole point was that I'm helping other people pay for their insurance. It's complicated. Yeah, and when things get that complicated, it's probably best to just let other people worry about it. Besides, you have other concerns right now, paying back your student loans. Remember, I thought you should be on this. I know. Yeah, let's eat. I could kill for a burger right now. Burger? No way. I mean, now that you're in the health pool, people are really counting on you to stay healthy. So sad for you. No dressing. <laughs> Seems like a double standard. Nope. It's a double cheeseburger. <laughs> I don't like uh, food chicken. forever. Alright, so the tensors of the gut relationship continue. Um, so yeah, uh, so laptop people, um, I'm not going to take out the point today, but remember our contract with our syllabus, it sets up <coughs> along these lines, use of personal digital devices, please turn off your vibrate and your phone and your ringer, you guys are doing good at that. Do not engage your device with anything outside of class, turn off instant messaging, close email, software, etc. So even me, my econ lab is off limits. Close my econ lab. No, you're, if you're using your laptop, it's just for notes only, just if you prefer taking notes that way. Okay? So shut down literally everything with no distractions coming in or you going out for a distraction. It's me, it's you, we're locked and engaged and hopefully learning some econ all at the same time. So. All right, any questions on that? <clears throat> all right, so we've got some serious stuff yet to hit. Um, we're basically starting chapter 11. Chapter 10 is pretty short. This is what we just did with accounting profits and economic profits. There's some other stuff uh, related to those situations, but we're going to spend the most time with chapter 11, which is right in with what we did, but focusing in on costs. The cost of production. So I want to think about a grocery store. And think about running a grocery store. We've all been in one. Start thinking about the different types of costs we have. And start brainstorming on your papers grocery store costs. Types of costs. I want you to come up and generate a list of at least 10 things right now in the next minute and a half. Types of costs. So just chapter 11? Yes, for grocery store. So we're a price chopper in town or we're your local grocery store back home, whatever one you're comfortable with. Brainstorm 10 things, go, minute and a half, go, 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 all types of costs. What, what kind of cost do we have for the business? 10 things. Produce, produce. So burn them up, burn them up. 67 seconds left, 10 things, grocery store, go, 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 go. You're inside, you're looking around. How did this business bring this to your attention? What are sorts of costs that they have? Noggin. 42 seconds left. I don't know. If you get done with your 10, you can keep going on to 11 even. 17 seconds. Go faster, Caleb. Go, 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 go. Where are we at here? Milk, toilet paper. Come on, come on. What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? When they hand you something. Produce. When you hand you first. I could be, I could be. Yeah, yeah, we got paper costs, right? So what about the employee that handed it to you? What about the manager? What about the paper? What about the shelving? 
Here's the distinction we want to start to think about. Why I wanted to brainstorm this list is that each company bases this on the things that change with the amount of product that they that they sell. So how does the grocery store make money? Selling crap, right? So what's the process of that? We got part of it up here. Somebody's ringing up the cash register and we've got that stuff coming out, right? So we've got that, that's how they're making money. Now, what part of these costs vary with the amount of volume that the store does that day? Costs that change depending on store volume. So in other words, we can think about What of these things on this list are going to change depending on the amount of quantity that we produce? What do you think? Grocery bags. Grocery bags. Good. So yeah, let's see. Where's our grocery bags? All right. So grocery bags. Paper. Paper off the at least the paper off the cash register. Number two. Number two. Paper for the register. Okay. Store map. The store map? Why is that? It does pay for two. Well, I don't know if that's going to, maybe it'll go a little bit, but I agree. So what do, for the store map, maybe explain your store map a little bit. How is that changing depending on the number of people that come through the door? Oh, it's not. Because I, mean, oh, it's not. It's I can think of a way it does. Okay, yeah, like Black what do you Friday. think? Okay, yeah, it could be a new one. Maybe it's a store map that's handed to you when you come in. Yeah, they might add a section. That usually does. I mean, we're, getting, we're kind of stretching it, right? We're so, modeling. So that might not change. Okay, what else up here? No, I kept my central map from last time. Cleaning supplies. So you think cleaning supplies, is that going to change? Is that a big difference? So if we have a really busy day versus a not so busy day, did we use that much more uh, Mr. Clean in the in the wash bucket as we were cleaning the floor? Did that cause a big increase in the amount of Mr. Clean? Or how about the the fingerprints that are on the glass? Thousand people versus two thousand people. At the end of the day, are we squirting more Windex on the thing? Not really, right? I can buy into that argument a little bit that that there might be some, but if there's a mess. And I have to call over my employee, did I pay extra to have that person come over and clean up that mess? No, no they just stopped stocking the shelves and they're gonna stay a little bit longer, right? So so not a huge thing there, but I'm with you. Now we got the juices flowing a little bit. Here, let me go to the back of the room again. Okay, good. So yeah, delivery and maybe stuff shipped in might be fixed, but if delivery is part of our daily operation, you know, maybe we would have more deliveries, but if we have an existing inventory on the shelves, we might not get shipments during the day. So it, it, in certain cases we might, but I think for most grocery stores, whatever's on the shelves that day is probably what stays there. They might have to go to the back room to replenish the, the shelf, but for the most part, it's continuous. Different trucks coming in, yeah. So different, different companies might be there. But I really want to think about the cost as we go beep, 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 beep. What are the costs that are changing? I'm with you. I hear your argument. I just, I'm just i thinking probably for the most part uh, there wouldn't be extra deliveries coming. They'd just run down their inventory even on a good day. We're going to need more employees and more people to come in. Okay, so employees. So do we call people in? Or do the other employees just have to bust the tail and they're running beep, 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 beep? Yeah. It's probably running beep, beep, beep. They're, they're just going to be, you know, they're there, they're standing there, and on a normal day, they might be beep, beep, take a break, talk to somebody. Oh, you need some help? Cash register four is open. Beep, beep. So on a busy day, they're just beep, 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 beep. Oh, the line never goes down. Beep, beep, beep. So I'm not really spending any more money unless I'm paying them for beep or something. Uh, losses. Losses. Okay, what do you mean by losses? Okay, if we were talking about, yeah, I don't know if that was here, but yeah, I'm totally with you. 
we might have more breakage of something, right? So if somebody breaks some product with that, so I think there's a good chance theft could go up. Yeah, so that, that could be something with higher volume of business. We might have some more, and so with losses, let's make sure we're clear on that. Uh, break goods, stealing, you know, those sorts of things might be varying with the volume of business. Okay, taxes. That could vary depending on what type of tax they are, but if it's sales tax and everything's a percent, then you're going to be paying more of those things at, at the cash register. Each beep is another little bit of taxes. Good? Anything else up here? Let me, let me pick on a couple things just to make sure. Uh, HR, the, the two people that we have in the HR department, are they working a longer day? Are they... <coughs> Probably not, right? They just deal with uh, some stuff, so that's not changing. Uh, the retirement benefits, retirement package, is that changing on, on that given day because of the increase? No, that's that's fixed, right? So we got that kind of fixed. AC increases as well, though. So if you have cold items, the machines are going to have to work harder and longer. So do you think that's a big expense? Electricity, or pretty much the electricity bill for the store on a given day, the freezers are on, they're going the whole time. They probably do have to work a little bit harder if, if we're pulling stuff out or the, the freezer door is being open shut, open shut, open shut because it's a high volume day. But do you think that's a huge increase? Well, yeah, but, but I'm talking specifically with the AC slash electric bill. That's probably pretty stable, right? Yeah, in, the, in, the grand scheme. Whether, in the grand scheme of things, if, if, we, if we have 100 people, we have 1,000 people, roughly the electricity is probably staying pretty fixed on that day. The manager, are we paying them? What, what type of pay do they likely have? A salary. So are they getting paid more on a high volume day? No. Maybe there's some bonuses or something, but they're pretty fixed. The cart. Are we buying more carts that day, or if we have a loan for the cart, we might have a couple repairs, but in general, is our cart expense skyrocketing? No, of course not, right? So this whole exercise is to try to park costs into only two categories. So for econ class this week, this section, this chapter, we're going to look at two types of costs when we break down costs. Variable cost and fixed cost. Variable cost and fixed cost. So this is a little bit different. I'm going to erase this part here, but this is different than the explicit implicit thing. So variable cost. <laughs> Variable costs. These are costs of production that vary with quantity sold slash produced. That vary with Q. Variable costs vary with Q. Fixed costs do not vary. Costs that do not vary with one. As we did with our little thought exercise, you guys already figured out that some of these costs are fixed. Like we could truly take the electric bill. If the electric bill was $100, then maybe 90 of it is fixed and $10 is really variable depending on how many times the freezer doors opens or shuts or whatever, right? So some of these categories, you know, there might be a little bit of a blend between the two and we would just categorize them differently. Electric cost that's fixed, electric cost that's variable. So the argument being made here is that we can take all of this list and either make them fixed or variable to some extent. All right, so equation goggle time, total cost is going to be partitioned into total cost 
is equal to the sum of total variable cost plus total fixed cost. So if you wanted to put the little total here, then this would be the some kind of work with our TBC and our TFC. Total cost can be broke down into those that are variable, those that are fixed. All right, so the price of our frozen pizza is how much? Give me a price of frozen pizza. $7, six bucks, $5, you know, whatever number you want to pick. But when we think about the price, we're in total revenue, we're in cash register land, right? The price is $6, you buy five of them, you go to the cash register, the person rings them up, not including taxes or anything. Price times quantity, who gave me the price times quantity? Blake, was that you? I'm sorry, what? Ah, was that you that gave me the price times quantity earlier? Uh, yes, sir. So, price times quantity, $6 times five units of Q, gives me $30 of total revenue, right? So, how can we look at the cost per unit here? If I sold 100 units that day, what would be my average total cost if my total cost was $64,000? How can I figure out my average total cost if quantity equaled uh, $100? If total cost of my business that day was sixty-four thousand, and I sold a hundred units, what would be my average total cost? Six hundred and forty, right? I'm just taking this divided by the number of units. Now gives me a per unit cost. So on the formula over here, let's just divide by Q. What I do to one side of the equal sign, I got to do to the other. And that gives us a nifty little result that we will use quite a bit. Average total cost, ATC, average total cost per unit, is equal to the sum of average variable cost plus average fixed cost. You want to draw a little box around this whole thing and then write these words next to it. Memorize this. That will come in really handy for the homework and tests and getting through the, this, this section. And then this is so important. This is going to continue on in chapter 11, 12, 13, on the rest of the way, actually, the rest of the semester. All right. What does this stuff look like graphically? So we're going to look at our graph. For starters, we're going to just measure dollars up here. So a lot of times we were putting price when we were talking about demand and quantity supplied and all that jazz. So dollars and quantity. If my total fixed cost of production that function looks like this. Why does it look like that? Well, if we did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 100. Yeah, it's fixed, right? What if I produce 10 units? Oh, total fixed cost is 100. What if I produce 1,000 units? 
the fixed cost? 100. 100, 100, 100. It doesn't matter what quantity I produce, my fixed cost is 100. Those don't change, just like we did with our grocery example, right? So it would be a perfectly horizontal line here anchored at the level of the total fixed cost, which was 100. What does the average fixed cost curve look like? Going up. Average fixed cost. Is that an up? That's a down? I had to look this way. I had to put a mirror up so I can understand your thing here. So, down. Is it going down or up? How many people say down? Down? All right. So, if I produce two units, what is the. So, Q is two now. What is my average cost per unit if I only produce two? My average fixed cost per unit? 50. So once we start to think about it that way, at two units, man, it's 50 already. What is it at three? 33.33. What is it at four? 25. You can see it's starting to come down quite a bit already. I just picked off four points from it. At one, it was 100, and at four, five, five. And so if you drew this all nicey-nicey, you would get a curve that comes down and approaches the horizontal axis, but never gets there. Yeah, never touches it, right? Because it's always something positive. And that is the average fixed cost curve. So it's a graphical representation of our average fixed cost. So I know some of you are still a little shaky on, uh, you know, what's going on on how to use the graphs. So if we say, what is, what is the average fixed cost at quantity equal to four? If that was the question and this was your graph on your homework, you would just go up to the average fixed cost curve, hang a left, read off that number, and the average fixed cost is equal to $25 per unit on average. The total fixed cost of all four units was still 100 bucks. So all we're doing is converting it to kind of a per unit, per unit basis. All right. That looks like a good spot to wrap up for today. So, Davis, I hope you're frozen now. I don't know if you already exited or not. And then Wyatt, I'm going to see you too with the. Well, uh, so, first of all, um, I don't want to have people taking the pictures because that's just. And I'm also recording everything, so it's on there. I noticed that you don't take notes. So, uh, I guarantee what you're going to find when I start doing that is a lot harder. Most of the time when I get students in that we can sit through class and you can kind of go, oh yeah, no, I understand it perfectly logical, I get it. And then you get to the whole time and oh crap. So you have to not only learn the toolbox, you have to learn how to use the tools. So when you see a lot of slaves, so it's a lot different. So right now you're you're past due on the search. Yeah. You know what you know you know what 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 you know what
they, they, they studied students that were typing notes on the computer versus those that were writing it down. There's something cognitive with actually writing it down in your own writing. And your own. Yeah. 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 Not everybody knows, but so anyway, there's, there's good research on it. So get in there and take a look. Um, I'm willing to give everybody one free. Otherwise, the other ones you're going to have to um, make up uh, with a penalty. And if you don't do them at all, then that's, that's going to take your grade down fast. Okay, I mean, really fast. So, um, it's your, your choice. Otherwise, maybe consider dropping if you got other things going on in your life. So, that's why I wanted to have that discussion with you. Okay, good. I'd like to see it. I was on the mic on that last night doing my homework. Yeah. And when I tried to go take the test, it wouldn't let me. Like, it would come up with something that was like, don't refresh the page or no negative. Yeah. I wasn't able to take the test. Let's pull, pull yours up. I took mine and I'll submit it first. Okay, I'll take a look. Did you guys email me at the time or? No, I didn't. If something like that happens, you should email me. Like, I, I my test. Not that I might be able to help you, but then I've got a documented that you had an issue and the timing of the issue. Uh -huh. Mine was, uh, I got to, I just finished 19, the low, go back, go back to the one I uh, passed over. Uh -huh. It froze on me, and I sat there for probably like 10 minutes, and I was just submit to see if it was on freeze, which in the Philippines popped up one is you have 7 minutes and 30 seconds before it stops. Like, okay, stay for Have you reopened it since then? Um, I haven't tried to, no. Yeah, I tried resetting my computer last night and it still wouldn't work. And then I uh, opened up my on that this morning and I was, that's what I was on in here. And it, uh, it said it was task two. So I wasn't able to do that. Yeah. Or this one. There are different task two. And so that was the one that you started but had trouble submitting? Yeah. Send me an email and I'll reopen it for you and you can give it another another whirl. All right. What time were you doing it at? It was right after I was doing the homework, so it was like 10 30. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. And so I want you to log into yours. I just want to say there's no excuse for my grades being the way they are other than the fact that I'm not facing that. Um, but for the crossing, we're about to do mandatory study hours, so my grades should be. Okay. Yeah, you guys, this is yeah. this course moves so fast. Yeah. You can't blow yeah. off. You can't blow off the first two weeks because no. you really blew off the first four weeks, right? Keep doubling everything. If you blow off two weeks, you really blow off four weeks. If you blow off three weeks, you really blew off a whole month. Yeah. Yeah. And we're halfway done. So I'm totally sorry. Okay. So I allow a freebie for one of them. So you need to email me individually and explain, and I will. Uh, open up one for free. I'll open up the other one, but you'll be penalized. And you guys need to jump on this. This stuff builds. This is not, like I said, that commute, the chapter eight, the utility thing, that one won't build on quite as much. But, and for sure, chapter three and all that, I mean, that's all sensible. We can use that stuff. So that, that's critical. Okay? Wait. I was just going to check to see if you're scored you have. Okay. It should now, yeah, you can pull yours up after it gets done. I checked last night after Or you got your you don't have your laptop with you? Okay. Yeah, if you I wasn't my laptop and you do that Yeah, yeah. If you got your laptop and watch you go, you you can go I right through that test last night and said I had like a yeah. yeah, we can check this off. So we got a,